Boom. All right, and we're back. So <laughs> welcome everybody to the Turbo Makes Games YouTube channel. I'm Johnny, joined by Ruben, aka the Game Dev Guru. Welcome in, Ruben. Hope you're doing well. Pretty good, man. Great, great. Good to see you again. Good to say the same words again after yep, the, for the failed the third stream. time now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're trying to do this live. Um, the uh, unfortunately, I've been having like some internet issues or something. For some reason, the Discord is coming through just fine. Um, but yeah, anyways, um, you got blacklisted by Google, man. Yeah, clearly, clearly. <laughs> Been a bad boy. Yeah, man. So how are things going? Things are going well. Um, so yeah, I was actually just doing a, a game jam over the weekend. I know we we're kind of talking about this in the live stream that we tried to do, but it didn't exactly work how we wanted. But um, yeah, we can kind of like show off uh, the game a little bit, kind of talk about it, uh, talk about some of the uh, my experience with developing it, and um, yeah, just kind of go from there. How is it called the game jam that you participated in? Um, so yeah, the it was the Team C's jam put on by Polly Mars. He's another YouTuber uh, on the platform here, and um, so yeah, it's it's basically a game jam meant to um kind of bring awareness to mr beast's whole you know team c's initiative about you know cleaning up trash out of the ocean um so as such i you know made this game here where um you're basically you know cleaning up all this trash off the beach here so as you can see i have, you know, to, say, I have to say that this reminds me of mallorca i'm from spain and sometimes <laughs> i've gone to mallorca <laughs> and when it's like high season right in summer and the tourists come here. Just all it's this like, crap is all you over see the beach. Yeah, 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 you can literally, if you're walking on the sand or something, and if you are unlucky, you could just, you know, stamp it into some kind of broken glass and you know, have fun with it. Yeah, that's uh, that's no good. But um, no, Not really the best experience. Yeah, yeah. So anyways, this is kind of the game, um, basically all made with uh, Unity's dots and ECS. And um, so yeah, basically we have uh, you know all this trash on the beach, and this is all these are all you know physical objects that can kind of physically interact with each other. Um, as you can see, we can you know select these different uh, workers here, and um, they'll be able to clean up trash off the beach. So I kind of have it set up where you actually um, once you select one of the workers, you press the number one key, and then you kind of have this like selection area, and you can kind of choose where they want to. Um, clean up trash off the beach. So if we just say select here, um, you know, we can kind of zoom in and you can see as they're walking through, they're kind of like, you know, pushing trash out of the way because again, it's all, um, you know, actual physical objects. So uh, basically the way it works is like the bigger objects, they take a little bit longer to, to basically pick up. Um, once they've picked up like basically their maximum capacity, then um, well, actually what happens, I'll just kind of like hang around here for now. Um, they'll kind of just like, wait they'll just be in like basically like a waiting state uh, which i think they are in right now it doesn't look like they're cleaning up any more trash um, and so if we select them and then we press the number two key then now we can select one of the trash cans um, here you'll see that there's kind of just like a bunch kind of scattered across the beach and that's how we set the uh, kind of drop off point so um, we can say set this here and then because it's um, basically at its kind of trash capacity it will bring it over to the trash can and throw away trash. And then, you know, basically depending on how much trash they're currently holding, it'll take a certain amount of time to uh, dispose of that trash into the trash bin. And once they have, then they will basically come back to their patrol area here. Um, and they'll just keep continuing doing that until the, um, the area is cleaned up. So um, that's kind of the, the, the basics of the game. Later. What's that? trash simulator Is it like trash trash simulator <laughs> so um yeah actually kind of the working title for the game is uh trash empire so um it actually it it was in originally intended to be um a lot bigger scoped than this um and i can kind of show you off some of the the ideas that i had for this uh previously but um you know basically the idea was, you know, you're bringing the workers are kind of bringing the trash to the trash bin, and that's kind of like the the first kind of phase of it. Um, and then from there, you'll see that I kind of have this little road set up. Um, the idea was that there would be like trucks kind of driving across this road, um, and then you know maybe they'd pick up these these trash bins or something. Um, hadn't figured out exactly how that was all going to work, 
Um, but basically the you know trucks would kind of come along this uh, little road here and then you'll see nice. there's a little bridge that can go across uh, to go across this little river here and then you'll see that it uh, comes back and across another bridge and then we'll come back here and then boom we can bring the trash up to this recycle center over here um, you know which for some reason has like an oil rig but um, anyways uh, yeah, so they'll, they'll took bring the some trash of these to assets the... from Black Friday. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah, these are basically all the uh, the Cinti low poly assets. Um, I I really like these a lot, and so kind of wanted to make a game using them. Um, so yeah, the trucks would basically Beautiful. bring the trash to the recycle center here, and uh, unload the trash. And basically, it was going to be um, you know for every pound of trash you picked up, uh, you'd receive a dollar because that's basically how. The, uh, the team sees uh, kind of initiative works is like every dollar that you donate to the team sees initiative equals one pound of trash cleaned up off the, the beaches or out of the ocean or whatever. Um, and then, so yeah, it was kind of like the idea about like growing your trash empire. Um, you know, the more money that you get from cleaning up more trash and bringing it to the recycle center, um, then that would allow you to, you know, hire more workers and you could, um, you know, maybe purchase more vehicles to pick up trash and then eventually get to the point where um, you could get like some boats and start cleaning up some trash out of the ocean, even though I don't have any trash in the ocean right now. Um, but yeah, that was, that was kind of the idea. Man, just dreaming of this, like the next iteration would be something like a tower defense where you get waves of tourists and you have to make sure that you have enough people hired because, you know, as the level advances, they will start bringing more bottles of beer and probably more wheels and barrels and yeah, stuff. Yeah, they have, uh, you know, tires and pallets and, you know, oil barrels and stuff. And then you get to wave number, let's say, wave number seven where the final boss comes, which is a bus full of German tourists, right? I say German because I live in Germany and I know that we tend to do this kind of stuff, sadly. Boss, that's like the final level, man. You have to have everybody on duty with the tiredness level, like, you know, uh, quite low. Otherwise, you wouldn't, you, you wouldn't be able to make it. How That's did you do awesome. the green part, the selection thing, by the way, like a projector or something? Yeah. So um, <clears throat> that's a, an interesting point that you brought up. So um, I kind of do the the selection ring here where it, it kind of like selects. You see that um, when you select the guy, it'll yeah. kind of circle around. Um, I did this the same way as kind of the selection <laughs> area here. Um, so actually in the latest version of uh, URP. So I'm using uh, URP, the universal render pipeline yeah. for this project. Um, so in the, in the latest version of it, it uh, allows you to, um, they're called like decals, basically where you can like project a sprite onto, um, you know, like a, a, a plane or a, some geometry. And then, so that's mm -hmm. kind of what this is. Although, um, because Unity ECS is only compatible up to um, version 2020.3 LTS, I can't use the latest version of URP. So I had to do this um, kind of manually, basically. Um, I found a, a really good tutorial online, um, and I, I kind of made ended up making this thing with shader graph. And um, it basically is just like a giant um cube with this shader on it um and then it, it kind of projects that onto the um onto the the uh, surface there we see it looks good man yeah 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 interesting yeah i think it came up pretty well um and i actually do have the unity project yeah man i can open up so the what unity was the biggest challenge in there. for you in the meantime yeah yeah so i think there were a lot of um there were definitely a number of challenges that I faced during the development of this project. Um, a lot of them was just kind of like integrating a bunch of things together that um, weren't necessarily all uh, really compatible with each other. Um, you know, I was doing obviously a lot of stuff with dots and ECS and then, um, yeah, so doing a lot of things with uh, dots and ECS, 
combined with um, stuff from the Unity Asset Store and um, some other things that I found online. So there were um, kind of like uh, some, uh, there was like a pathfinding library that um, I found that someone had. So you can see it, it kind of does like the uh, kind of like mesh hmm, navigation right. here. Um, and that worked pretty well for the most part, but you know, there was just kind of like a little bit of like figuring out how that worked. Um, and you know, some stuff with the unity dots physics. Um, so, I mean, there's just kind of like a lot of, um, moving parts and getting those all to sync well was, uh, was pretty challenging. I guess that you, that the stakes are high, right? If someone ever catches you doing object oriented programming, will instantly unsubscribe from all your content, right? <laughs> exactly. I'm not a real developer if I go back to OOP. <laughs> yeah. Once you go there, there's no coming back. Exactly. I mean, I never said I was exclusively, you know, uh, focused on dots. So I have the skills <laughs> to be switching back and forth as I need. But you, man. Yeah, I've locked back. myself in. That's brutal. <laughs> So yeah, and then I can kind of show off this here. Um, I don't know why. Okay, yeah, so you can kind of see that it's basically like a giant cube. And then mm -hmm. um, we're using this shader to project the uh, renderer onto the mesh here. So yeah, you see this big old cube and it projects that onto there. What's the feature called again in Europe? Do you remember the name of the feature? Decal. Decal. Oh yeah. Yeah. Does it work similarly to you know to projectors? Do you know? It does. Um, so actually, when I I think I tried to like implement a projector in here, and then it said um, I got some warning. It said like it was either deprecated or um, wasn't compatible with URP. And it said to, to use decals. So then I looked up decals, and unfortunately, in um, the version of URP that I was using, it it wasn't as available feature. So um, had to do it with shader graph. Let me see if I can pull up this uh, shader actually, because it is quite complicated for um, just this simple little feature here. How much uh, have you dove into shader graph? Played a bit, but it always annoyed me a bit, mostly because it didn't implement the feature that I needed very often. Like for example, GPU instancing was not there. Maybe mm. it's now available. I don't know. But back in the days, it was not. It was pretty hard to use, you know, features like this that were critical for all the projects that I was running. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I in that regard, Amplify was always a better choice for me. That makes sense. I just yeah. hope that Shader Graph catches up some point maybe they did already i don't know yeah I, I think shader graph is cool um my problem with shader graph is basically the same problem i have writing with um like shader scripts is like i don't really know how to like think in the in in the shader mindset yet so like you know i, I can have like an idea for a, an effect in mind but i just have like no idea how to get from you know zero to 100 um so yeah i ended That's up following you're a programmer <laughs> so yeah, I ended up following a, a, a good tutorial for this um, that I found online. And yeah, there's kind of like all sorts of crazy operations going on. I wouldn't say crazy. I mean, there are a lot of kind of simple operations, but I don't really understand, you know, why we have to do each of these steps to get to um, where we are. But yeah, I mean, it, it ends up being, you know, kind of a, a pretty decently large Spaghetti, they call spaghetti. it, right? We'll have a spaghetti blueprints. And if you come as well from Unreal, we'll have spaghetti shaders. <laughs> this is the usual term that we actually. I don't. Use I don't think this that. is too bad of spaghetti. Like everything's nah, going. Everything's going bad. pretty linearly, uh, for the most. But part. you have seen spaghetti blueprints, right? Wait, yeah. Let oh, me yeah. find something. Okay. Spaghetti blueprints. So I have to. To, to, to improve my pronunciation in Italian because my girlfriend is Italian and if I would just say spaghetti a spaghetti spaghetti <laughs> <laughs> I love it alright uh, let me give you a good spaghetti a good plate of spaghetti 
that is good spaghetti, <laughs> man. That's good pasta. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, that's... Um... Now you try to debug it, man. Yikes. That's, uh, that's a, a, a giant spider web of... Madness. Uh, blueprints. And I would like... quit my job, man. If if someone tells me you have to fix this shit, I would just quit my job. Whatever. Yeah. Is, yeah. Man. You you come in there. You no come one in their first day. Enough. You come in their first yeah. day. They say, "Hey, we need you to fix this feature," and they give you this. Yeah. I will say something like, "I'm gonna have a smoke." <laughs> <laughs> Never come back. <laughs> Jesus, man. Anyway, that's the graph that you were writing was was good, man. Yeah. You know? The only the only thing that I have also with shaders is that you know it's like exactly like with the scripts right, script runners right the graphical ones I forgot the name right now is that you know if you know programming you basically know what the shader does in just a few lines of code right while with this you have to be scrolling so if you're really good I think code is very effective mm. it's much more effective but if you are not an expert I am not you know, creating shaders. It is also cool to see how the nodes are transforming your data, right? Yeah, your yeah. You have that like, visual that. representation. And like you yeah. can kind of like see that basically at every step along the way. Like, you know, yeah. you know, you start with this and then you kind of like move and there's the different pieces. And but I mean, you know, like it it in in some cases, like for example, this one, like how does this translate to um you know basically projecting a sprite onto um uh some some other geometry in the world carefully you know <laughs> yeah i mean it's it's just a matter of practice right i guess that a technical artist what they do is like they try to think okay this is the final effect that i need to achieve and over time, they just develop these mental patterns. It's like, oh, if I have this texture and I do this multiplication and then I do this mask and I blend them together and then I multiply it by 1.3, I get what I want. It's like, you know, it's just a matter of experience. Uh, honestly, I'm not that experienced, right? Uh, I will see my, you know, some of my colleagues who are technical artists. I see them work and it's like, juice, man, this is amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, there's some pretty sometimes even stuff the most expert do. ones, even the most expert ones are like, dude, I don't know how I've done it. It just works. I, I have no idea how math works, but it works. I was like, how the fuck? I don't get it, man. But it's incredible. It's like magic. Yeah. Yeah. No kidding. Um, yeah, I think the kind of other thing that I wanted to bring up a little bit, um, was uh kind of like the the state machine so i ended up making kind of like a state machine uh with unity ecs um again this is kind of my first um stab at doing something like this so um definitely learned a lot about um you know kind of how we can kind of set things up let me just i'm gonna close out of all of these object oriented programming classes i see <laughs> <laughs> you see we're inheriting from system base man these aren't object oriented so let's see i do have i do have one mono behavior script and it is a the camera controller don't know what to think of you man anymore <laughs> anyway let's see i'm a fraud let's see the state machine it's been a while i don't implement one myself um so yeah this is kind of the uh sort of like the initial state which is um the unit select, I call it the unit select state system. Um, and this is basically where um, we kind of start out and um, we can kind of, you know, select the different units in the world. Um, so it's, it's just kind of like the general state. You can see that we're basically just doing um, kind of a, a basic kind of ray cast here. Um, and then so we want to, when we want to actually select a unit here, it uh, just calls this select unit function. And um, what we actually do here is, so we um, will add a selected entity tag to the selected unit. So a tag, of course, is just an empty data component. And then 
um, we can go to the next system here, which is the unit selected state system. So this means um, we're kind of in the state where we have a unit selected. Now, um, you'll see that on here, I have the uh, require singleton for update selected entity tag, um, and also have the unit select state tag, which I do have in the, the initial system. Um, I should have mentioned in the onCreate, we have the require singleton for update. So basically what that means is the update function will only run if this singleton um, that, that has that specific tag uh, in the world, uh, if, it, if it exists, then um, it, will, it will only update. So that's basically kind of how I can kind of trigger which state is running is by saying, um, you know, if that singleton is uh, present in the game, then it will run. Um, All right. Yeah. But one question in this Please. sense, if you don't mind, how can you make sure that you don't mess up the states as a developer, I mean, as a programmer? Uh, could you have eventually like overlapping states just because you forgot to add one of these requires? Yes, good question. And so that, that was kind of like, I did get into that a little bit at the end when I was just kind of... Um, just implementing some more of these systems and not being like super careful about it. Um, so that that was kind of the one of the things that was like it was a little bit tricky to uh, uh, to debug. Sometimes um, you kind of get in some like weird um, states. So yeah, actually for um, this, I have intentionally um, have both these states active at the same time. And so the reason for that is, um, so basically if you already have a unit selected and then you click off of the unit or you click a different unit, then it will, um, you know, deselect the currently selected unit. Right. Um, and so, yeah, that, that's kind of something that you do need to be careful with, um, is just like making sure that you're, uh, actually in the state that you, um, uh, intend to be in. Yeah, because the worst case scenario is that you could be in multiple states, right? And maybe you realize too late that that is happening, right? Because maybe you have forgotten one of these requires, right? Yeah. It could be... Yeah. While you were doing object-oriented programming, in general, you only have one state active at a time, depending on how you program it, of course. But this is nice because it also gives you flexibility, right? To be running multiple states. If you are careful, if you do this carefully, right, you could, uh, you know, unless you do overlapping behavior, that would be bad. Yeah, yeah. Kind of reminds me of the animation part of Unity where you have like different layers, right? You have maybe one layer for the upper body and you also have one yeah, layer for yeah. the lower body that they can all run in parallel. But if you mess up, you could be running, uh, I don't know, maybe it's the hand on the lower body layer <laughs> and you could cre create this kind of conflicts where you are updating the same thing twice. So yeah, I guess that depends on, you know, being a bit careful with that, but I think it's cool. Yeah, it, it is flexible. Exactly. And I'll show you kind of um, how I was managing this a little bit. So I basically just kind of went on my whiteboard and just kind of was like mapping out uh, like all the, all the different kind of states in the game um and kind of you know what can go to where and what happens when the different actions happen and stuff like that so nice yeah Did you what's that on the button left it's like a timer or a temperature oh yeah yeah it's a, a little temperature monitor that i have in my room it's a temperature right. and humidity <laughs> so it's always it's always funny to look over there in the summer and see like oh it's way hot in here all right Cool, man. I've been thinking about getting a whiteboard as well for me. Uh, right now, I'm just using, you know, like a random notebook. Yeah. But I, I don't want to drill on the wall because I know that these things... So I actually just been using the uh, the command strips. You ever use the command strips? It's like like kind of glue, right? You mean for the wall? No. What's well, that? So here, I got a bunch right here. So basically, they're like... Uh, these little like kind of Velcro strips. Ooh. So here, I'll show them to you there. Show them to the camera there. So basically you kind of like peel these apart and then 
they're like Velcro, so they'll like you know stick together. But you have to glue the there. both parts right onto the wall and onto the white. Yeah, wall, so right? it's, it's basically double that. stick. It's basically double stick tape. So you just you know peel off the back yeah, there, yeah. and then um, you know one side sticks to the wall, one side sticks to the object that you want. And then the cool thing is, you see there's kind of like this little tab at the bottom, right? So you see yeah. there's kind of like the Velcro portion and the little tab. Let's show it to the camera, Velcro portion. If it focuses, yeah, Velcro portion in the tab. And then so basically when you're done, you just pull down on the tab and then that cleanly takes it off the wall and it doesn't leave any marks or residue or anything. That's pretty good because I made one mistake. I tried something like this. I don't know if it was this one specifically, I guess not. But you know, it was like one of these thin whiteboards where on the other side, on the back side, you had like glue, right? It's not, and it's not like glue, it's, it's, just, it's like something like tape. And I put it on the wall and when I had to move out, I took it out and it was like, I messed this up, <laughs> never again. I started doing like this and then all the wall was coming off. So I, I, it's not like, you know, like the outer layer, like the paint, like, no, it was like a thick thing like this. So I basically had to redo like that wall yeah. just because of the stupid glue of that whiteboard. So never again, if I ever have to buy one of these whiteboards without reading, I will probably think of this Velcro. Yeah, just no, I, I highly nice, recommend man. these. I, nice. I use them for my whiteboard and, you know, just all kinds of, uh, they're good for like, if you want to hang like a poster or a sign or something like that. Good. Never again. <laughs> I made it like, you know, uh, let's play with this. So it looked pretty good for the time it lasted. And then I had to move out and it was like, all right, 200 bucks less for the painter that I had to invest on. There you go. <laughs> Never again. Yeah. Um, so yeah, anyways, back to the, uh, the state machine here that I was creating. Um, Let's see. So yeah, then basically the next state is the unit selected state system. Um, so this one, what happens is you can either press the number one key or the number two key. Uh, pressing the number one key, that will basically change it to the set patrol area state. And that's kind of where that uh, you know blue ring uh, shows up and you can kind of select where um, you want the, the uh, little worker that you have selected uh, to drop off the trash. So when that happens, we say the uh, change to set patrol area state. All this does is this is going to remove the unit select state off the game controller. So that means um, the, uh, the, uh, we can no longer basically select another unit or deselect the currently selected unit. Um, and then it will also add the set patrol area state tag. So this brings us into another state, which is the uh, set patrol area state system. Uh, now I wanted to bring this one up because this one's kind of cool um, because um, what happens is, you know, of course this is, has these, you know, require singletons for update. Um, so it needs an entity with the selected entity tag, meaning that we have selected an entity as well as the set patrol area state tag, meaning that we're um, basically can set the patrol area. Um, you'll see that we have uh, a decent amount of code inside the on start running function. So basically every time we enter this system, um, all this code in the on start running is going to uh, begin. So this is kind of like, um, you know, kind of some setup stuff for us um, for this particular state. So what this, basically does is it um, instantiates into the world. You can see we do this entity manner dot instantiate and it, it actually spawns in that, um, you know, selection area. And then inside the update function, then that's basically where we, um, you know, because we already have the selection area spawned in, we can kind of move it around uh, the world based off of the mouse position. And then, um, you know, basically kind of the, the, uh, uh, contrast of that is in the on stop running, you'll see that we'll just go ahead and destroy that patrol area. So we can kind of have the, uh, like the setup phase with the on start running, the update phase in the on update, and then uh, kind of the cleanup phase in the, uh, the on stop running. 
So what do you think of that? This is one of the bigger files, right? That you have. With Let's more see. Code, yeah, this right? one's about yeah, 130 lines. I think um, I think there's one other s script. Um, I don't know if I have. Yeah, I think this is one of the one of the larger ones that I wrote. Um, yeah. I think it's pretty readable, right? Uh, I think if you read through that, like top down, right? Or from top to bottom. Yeah, yeah. And that's kind of one of the ways that I like to structure my code down. is like similar to the life cycle of the system. So you'll see that I start with on create, then I go to on start running, then I have on update, then I kind of have like the helper functions. So like the actual set patrol area is what gets called after we, you know, actually click to like finalize where we want the control area. Um, we have the, the change state. So this changes basically once we click to select, then we'll go back into the state of just having the entity selected. Um, and we can choose kind of some operations from there. I have a little Raycast mm -hmm. helper function. And then um, I end with the on stop running here. Pretty much understandable. Talking about dots, I have a question. So I'm working yeah. for um, a consulting client right now. Mm -hmm. He is targeting the super powerful Chromebooks that uh, only have yes. two cores. The super powerful and Chromebooks. And they are doing this kind of Intel Celerons with <laughs> barely maybe 40 gigabytes of RAM, which is not bad, you know, the 40 gigabytes of RAM at least. Thanks for that. Yeah, sure. But yeah, we are talking about two core CPUs. And the reason I'm asking this is because Unity, you have the main thread, right? Running all the time, doing your game logic, a bit yes. of rendering and such. Yeah. Oh, my cat is messing with my... Yeah, I saw the, the screen. <laughs> screen. <laughs> there you go. Ah, I don't know, if, I don't know if it came through on... Jesus. And uh, as I was saying, and then you also have the second thread, which is, you know, very busy usually with the uh, rendering, uh, which we call a uh, render thread. So how much potential do you think there is to use dots in a way that it actually favors you when we are targeting, you know, hardware that has like two cores, not even hyper threading, right? like two cores, right. two threads. Yes. Yeah. So I have an idea there. What yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I mean, obviously, so there's a lot to dots more than just um, kind of multi-threading. So multi-threading really only comes into play um, when you're when you're thinking of the uh, like the C sharp job system, um, and actually like scheduling you know jobs onto different threads and stuff like that. But um, whoa, you let me just else? pull it up. I don't want my cat to make any hole in the green screen. Yeah, 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 yeah. No problem. It looks kind of cool now. Right. It looks kind of like back to business. Yeah, it looks cool. Uh, the, uh, the effect. <laughs> People think it's actually looking like that. It's like, what? That, yeah, that's yeah, there's some like kind of screen. modern artwork going on back there. <laughs> yeah, sorry. So you were saying that dots is indeed just more than multi threading, right? That's yeah, uh, probably yeah, the yeah. biggest part. So I, I, guess, I think but... there are um, a number of other areas that could kind of benefit from dots. Um, I, I think obviously the big one is going to be the burst compiler. Um, so that's going to. Um, it does kind of a lot of like uh, SIMD operations. So like single instruction, multiple data, um, which I would assume that um, that processor could take advantage of. Um, I mean, I don't see why it wouldn't. Um, so I, I think there's kind of some things in there. Um, and then um, depending on like what it's rendering, I mean, potentially the the hybrid renderer could um, give you kind of some some benefits in the the graphical department. Um, but yeah. yeah, not sure exactly where kind of the uh, the current issues are lying. But um, um, I had some other suggestions. I think yeah, okay. like the burst compiler would be the big one. And I guess that the burst compiler can do a lot there because of course. Even if you don't make things in parallel, you 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 know in advance the data you are working with. That's why you can apply the single instruction, multiple data operations, right? Correct. While otherwise you couldn't do that uh, yourself, I guess. I don't know. Because our Unity couldn't do that for you uh, if you were not using the DOTS um, uh, framework, I guess. Because Unity doesn't know in that case the type of data that you're managing, right? If you're doing object-oriented programming, right? 
you will have to find a way to do this kind of manually. I don't know if that's possible, but it is one of these hell scenarios where you have like 50 scripts, each script taking 0 0.01 millisecond. And it's like, what do I do with this, right? <laughs> Should I convert every single script into dots? It's like... Yeah, that might be a pretty big uh, overtaking to convert the whole entire project into dots. I mean, obviously, depending on the scope of the project and all. Yeah, it's probably one of the worst scenarios, right? Where you have tons of scripts that are done, of course, in object-oriented programming. And each of those just take a little bit of time, just a bit, just enough to bother, you know, mm -hmm. that still, you know, and they're executed like sequentially, right? And I guess that's hard to convert, right? It takes a lot of time. Not sure what your experience is regarding converting OOP code to dots. Yeah, I haven't done a lot of uh, converting, but that's something that I kind of want to get into a little bit. Um, so mm -hmm. I, Unity actually has published kind of these um, like simulation kind of projects. Actually, I can probably pull them up here. What's a simulation? Ah, you mean like the flying car scene, right, and such? Um, not that one specifically, but they have a bunch of, um, here, I'll just pull it up and show you. Give me one sec to there. That's training samples. Yeah. So, um, this is actually what, uh, unity uses internally to kind of like train their teams on dots. And, uh, basically what it is, is a bunch of these kind of simulations. These are all basically made. Um, with game objects and mono behaviors, and you can kind of you know download these different projects. And um, the idea is they are basically all made with primitives, so they'd be like you know really easy for you to convert these over into dots and ECS projects. And um, yeah, they're just kind of like a bunch of little like simple simulation things um, nice. to you know kind of help you practice um, you know actually getting more into the data oriented mindset and, um, you know, solving problems. Um, and so you can kind of see, um, like, you know, what your performance is in the, um, game object and mono behavior side, and then, you know, how much of a performance improvement you get when you switch over to, um, dots and ECS. So, yeah, I think these are super cool and I kind of want to make some, um, more content on the channel and stuff That's about, lot. you know, going through these. Yeah. There's, there's a bunch of these. So they they use this originally, like internally, you mean, for the internal teams in order to show and to teach how dots works? Yeah, or? yeah. And actually, you can see um, if you go to the different branches here, there's like like hundreds and hundreds of branches Jesus. from um, mm. like the different teams who've kind of like gone through these exercises. And wow. um, by the way, none of these branches are to say like this is the you know correct way that you should do anything in dots and ECS like these are mostly just you know teams kind of learning this for the first time and you know taking their stab at it um, but you know if you want you can kind of go through these and see um, so how like some of these other teams um, you know tackled these these different problems um, so yeah I think this is like a super great resource for anyone who's um, yeah, thanks for that know, yeah wants to get into to dots here. and ECS programming and um, here I'll send you the uh, link there so you have it so they were keeping this thing for themselves right until now uh this has actually been public for a while i think all right i i've came across this That's a generous. long time ago but i kind of forgot about it so generous of unity to publish this yeah no seriously it's great sounds like a good thing to try out for a weekend right if you're into dots. yeah totally do a little kind of like kind of like a little game jam treat it like a little game jam almost and it's cool because, I mean, you already have kind of like a sample project that you can kind of reference and it, um, you know, has basically all this stuff kind of working already. And then um, it's basically just up to you to to implement the kind of code portion of it. Nice. And yeah, you can kind of like go on like the little drop down. It'll give you like some details about, um, you know, some of the requirements for, for each of these projects. Cool. Yeah. I wish they taught this kind of stuff in the university, man. <laughs> Dude, seriously. seriously. Can you imagine just going to computer science? Today, we're going to learn about 
Stutz and ECS and such. Yeah, I know. That'd be awesome. Yeah. I think the closest thing I have learned to this is probably nothing. Like, no, not really. Never learned about data-oriented programming in the university. I, I think they should have. Yeah, neither did I. I. I mean, it was pretty much all focused on uh, object-oriented programming, you know, learning the data yeah. structures and stuff. And I do think that stuff is important and those are you know good skills to learn. But um, um, Did it make you learn Pascal as well? No. Um, most okay. of my learning was in C++ and then I did uh, some game courses where we were doing C Sharp and Unity. Nice. Yeah. yeah they asked me to learn uh, Pascal. I had like two subjects, like yearly subjects on Pascal, and I was like, Jesus. Which is okay, it's just weird things like, I think the, the indexes, indices, indices in, in arrays start at one and things like this. Mm. And it was like, screwed my brain. Once <laughs> I, you know, I, I was coming from, from C++, and I was like, whoa, yeah. starting yeah. at one, it sounds super weird. Yeah, That's why I remember, but probably, you know, I try to forget these things anyway, <laughs> this trauma. Interesting. But yeah, man, pretty good stuff. I mean, Dots is cutting edge as well. Uh, you know, they just sit stand and such. So I guess that's also one reason that they don't talk too much about it. I know that data oriented programming has been there for a long time, but it hasn't gotten too much love, right? At yeah. least in Unity and something. And yeah, I, I definitely think that's changing, obviously, with, uh, you know, Unity's dots. And I see... Um... You know, now that I've been like looking up a bunch of these like videos on YouTube and stuff, I'm seeing all kinds of recommended things for data oriented programming. Um, you know, even people just like outside of games, like just kind of implementing this stuff in, in regular software development and, um, you know, kind of how much they can improve performance by just, you know, kind of thinking about data and um, the transformations and, you know, structuring it in such a way that uh, really complements, you know, how the computer works. Yeah, indeed, because you can only scale so much, right, uh, in terms of logic and behavior or performance if you only run your stuff in one thread. It's like buying one of these CPUs with 32 cores, 64 threads, and then running, I don't know, it's going to say crisis, and then you check the, you know, the details, and it's like core 1, 100%, core 2, 264, 0%. <laughs> so, Here yeah, get, you can uh... scale only so much. This is mine right here. We got Dude, the. Uh, you also have, you also have the CPU. <laughs> we got the. Uh, this is the the 16 core, 32 thread. It's the new uh, AMD Ryzen 5950. Yeah, I've got it as well. I was trying to get something in between, maybe like uh, the 59 or something like that, right, the 5900, right. but yeah. it was out of stock. So the only thing yeah, I had the, the uh, was to choose between a 58 or a 5950, <laughs> yeah. and I said, "Dude, I'm not going to compromise here. Let's go all in." Exactly. I ended up picking that one. Yeah. No, I specifically wanted this one because, you know, obviously I'm doing a lot of the, um, you know, kind yeah. of multi-threaded stuff with, with dots and all that. But um, you see that, you know, when I run it and um, it'll take a little while to run in the editor. But, yeah, we, you know, we'll get a couple of these guys running. And, um, yeah, I mean, basically all the cores are being used. Okay. Johnny, it's time to expose your internals. Show me the profiler. I want to see something. All right, let's get it. Control 7. Good point. I always forget that. <laughs> <laughs> Go to the... Just stop recording or something. Stop recording the profiler. Just press the red button or click somewhere. Exactly, click somewhere there in the CPU usage. Now, go down there and open the category that says job. Oh, wait. Yeah, that's how I like it. You see all the screen stuff? It's nice. good, right? That's how it should always look like. Right? <laughs> that's pretty good, man. I mean, that's the way to use the entire hardware, which is the way to scale, honestly. That's the future, yeah. right? Yeah, 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 for sure. Because if you don't do anything like this, you know, in general, you would just be maximizing for sure the core number one, which is rendering at least the high level commands of rendering plus your game thread plus you know like your your logic plus physics and such and then you have core number two which is running the render thread and apart from that you know <laughs> you're gonna just be sitting idle 
uh, with object-oriented programming. So that's just the way to do it, man. I mean, this is how it should look, every profiler that I yeah. open. Yeah, no, I, I love the it. Green. I mean, I, I definitely enjoy um, developing with a data-oriented mindset. I, I kind of find the, the challenge fun. Um, I think there's a lot of kind of like benefits about, you know, you can do things nice and cleanly. Like I like, um, you know, some of the things that I was doing with the uh, state machine were pretty easy to implement because they're in these, you know, separate systems. And again, we kind of have, you know, we can do like the setup phase, the update phase and the cleanup phase. Um, but there, there definitely was uh, a fair number of headaches that I ran into, uh, particularly when it came to debugging. Um, so here I'll, I'll close out of the profiler here and was showing you, I, I was kind of running into some, um, issues inside jobs and really the only way that you can kind of debug them is to, um, uh, go into burst, uh, turn off the burst compiler. And, um, I think, uh, yeah, I just had that as is. And I'll show you how poorly this performs without the burst compiler. But still multi-threaded, right? Uh, yeah, still multi-threaded. But um, we're running at uh, 0.7 frames per second right now. Jesus. And then I... Get no good news, man. Look here, like, I'll, I'll push the... Uh, like, I mean, there's like a good one full one second of input lag. It's like, look, I'll press the number one key. And... I can bet that your computer Boom. is not happy about this. <laughs> stop it, man. Stop it. Don't do this to your computer. Yeah, look at this. We, we are maxed out on 32 threads here. Jesus. It's and special. it was really annoying because I had to... Um, like, it, it took a, a little while for the... Um, the issue to pop up, like it was only kind of happening in, in certain scenarios. Um, I think it was like when two units tried to pick up the same piece of trash, basically, <laughs> even though I, I thought I had made like some certain checks in place to um, not stop that from happening. But then, um, you know, it was kind of one of those weird things where the, just the way that the States, you know, kind of went in and out of states and then it eventually happened. So then I had to put in some extra kind of checks and balances and, and was able to get that all resolved. But um, yeah, it was, it was kind of painful to debug that. Like it, it literally took like 10 minutes of me at one frame per second, just scheduling these workers to go clean up trash all in the same area um that's a frustrating experience man yeah it's it's like you are aging at 10 times the usual right yeah yeah i mean there's probably smarter ways that i could have gone about doing that like maybe have uh like an actual debug scene set up where i don't have you know ten thousand pieces of trash and 64 workers on the beach um, but maybe that's also the reason that it happens, right? At some point, these kind of issues, right? If you scale down in content yeah, as well, yeah, yeah, yeah. maybe that these pressing conditions do not pop up anymore. Yeah, so totally. you have to be living with this one second delay. And I mean, it's super frustrating, right? Whenever that happens to me, it's like my willpower is like depleted. <laughs> I finish this kind of stuff and I need to order pizza or something like this, man. No, and I was doing this like late at night, but I don't know, there was just something like, so almost like addicting that just like made me want to like i'm just like I've, I, i'm so close i know it i just need to like yeah. yeah then you go to bed and start having nightmares with all of this and <laughs> to wake up in the middle of the night it's full of sweat i just see these like warning messages in my in my sleep like <laughs> <laughs> when you close your eyes that embedded there burst has detected a leak pretty good man but yeah yeah so i mean that's uh That'll show the the performance of the burst compiler right there. I mean, again, you know, go back into it. Obviously, the performance in the editor is not going to be as good, but we are running at um, like 80, 90 frames per second. And that without adding a sleep function just to fake it. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, so that's kind of the game that I was working on. So any next step for this? Do you want to keep working on something 
along the lines of this project or yeah i thought this project was a, a fun exercise um it's you know really kind of like the you know idea of the the game like this is kind of similar to like a city builder or something like that which i think really lends itself super well to dots because obviously you have you know like all the little people running around doing their things and you can kind of um you know, do do lots of kind of like larger scale kind of simulations. Um, so I, I really wanted to kind of go through the exercise of uh, creating this um, uh, uh, bigger empire. world and all that. Yeah, yeah, the trash empire. <laughs> um, I mean, it's a perfect use case for dots, like thousands of uh, kilos. Yeah. Pants of trash. Yeah, what yeah, else totally. Can you be asking for it. Yeah, I, I kind of wanted to do this because I feel like a lot of people who maybe are um, looking into Unity dots, um, they're kind of like some of the people they might be making a game in this type of genre, um, or you know at least something kind of similar. And I feel like you know me kind of going through some of these experiences will um, you know kind of like help me understand um, some of the challenges that people may be going through and all that. Mm -hmm. I think developers can really use your skills, man. Yeah, I think there's there's a lot of really good and interesting stuff coming from uh, Unity Dots and um, very excited for uh, some of the new releases of it because I know it's been a while and I know they've been working hard and um, I think there's going to be a lot of, a lot of really good stuff coming. Uh, hopefully soon. I was kind of hoping to see it by now, but... Um, like a Christmas present, right? Exactly. But no. <laughs> exactly. And it's gonna make you happy, man. I'm sorry to hear that. No, I mean I'm I'm still having um I'm still enjoying working with the tool set right now. But again, there are just kind of, you know, some little features here and there that um I know will be cleaned up very soon that um will just make things the development experience a lot better. Yeah, there's always so much to learn, right? About dots and such. Yeah. Oh yeah. I don't know. My experience was, you know, I like I shared once on my email list was like I was just, you know, I started working on a project and you know, you could do whatever you wanted, except that you had to follow the rule of, you know, everything you do has to be on dots, right? And uh you know, maybe the exception could be something like, you know, you can code maybe some tools for the editor in object or in the programming if you want. But right. everything, like 100%, had to be running on dots. Like whatever gameplay system that you worked on had to be running on dots. And that was, you know, once you have this constraint in mind, so many things that I took for granted that I could <laughs> just do very easily, it was not so easy anymore, right? You had to, do, you know, uh, find my way through many things that were not implemented yet in Unity Dots. Right. And, uh, you know, I actually, you know, I ended up learning quite a lot about Dots, not only Dots, but also how to, you know, certain things uh, should be implemented. I think in my case it was about local avoidance when you are doing the navigation part between characters, right? Yeah, that yeah. They just do not do like this and stay like this forever. <laughs> And I was like, okay, I don't think it could be that hard to implement this, right? And I think I spent a good week reading and all of these algorithms about, you know, how to oh, make yeah. sure that yeah, because you're like not you're like have uh, to like code it by hand basically because there isn't anything yes. built in. Yeah, exactly. That was my experience, <clears throat> right? And even the smallest detail like this can actually be super complicated, right? Apparently, you know, these things can look. Like, like super innocent at the beginning, right? Where you say, well, I don't think this can be that hard. And when you get into that, it's like, Jesus, this takes longer than I expected, right? You start reading like all these papers online on local avoidance. And it's like, whoa, 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 <laughs> what is this going to? Yeah, no kidding. Yeah. That's where you start missing all the nice features that Unity implemented for you, right? Yeah, no, definitely. Um, and so that actually brings me to uh, another thing that was I was kind of um, wrestling around with a, for a little while with this project was uh, pathfinding. Um, so there were kind of like a couple different options actually available to, um, you know, kind of some pathfinding solutions for dots. So um, I 
so there there is kind of the um, Unity has one. It's called the uh, the Nav Mesh Query, and um, yeah. there are a, a few videos online from I think. Um, so from some Unite, I think, if I recall correctly, right? yeah, Where they spoke about this system, yeah, yeah, from that, and then there's also a, a another YouTuber. I think uh, let me pull up his name right now because uh, let me give him a shout. But it out. felt like super low level, right? I guess it's still a work in progress. Uh, at least it was back then. But you know, I was like super low level. It's like I want to go from here to there. Like that was the query. And it gave you like the edges or something like that. I forgot the exact name for that. It's like it's based on triangles or something like this instead of locations in the world. And then you had to query for the position, the, the world position of these triangles, which were mapped to surfaces and such. And then you had to kind of make your own way through that. Of course, that didn't yeah. uh, work with local avoidance. You know, it's like, Jesus, there is so much work into this yeah. uh, that I just took for granted, right? Yeah. No, yeah. And, and the YouTuber who um, has made some videos on it, it's a Forging Station. And um, mm -hmm. so, yeah, he's done some stuff with the NavMesh query and he did implement his own kind of like local avoidance system. Um, but even in his videos, he was talking about like a lot of the struggles and he said he was just experiencing crashes all the time and it was just a real crashes. headache. Jesus. Yeah, yeah, he was he was getting a bunch of crashes. So I was like, okay, I'm kind of probably gonna try and avoid that for a, a game jam project. Avoid, that's the word. And then it was um, funny because the local avoidance, uh, you know, I was, I was like, should I spend like a week implementing something nice, or maybe two weeks? I didn't know, right? Because yeah. I never did local avoidance. Or should I maybe just do this shortcut where everybody just turns a bit to the left? if there is any collision <laughs> and you know that worked uh, pretty well when they were facing like this sure right? yeah yeah but at some point i tried this other scenario in which they, they were like going crossways and yeah, then, then they, they were just, just... <laughs> 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 anyway this is also stuff that happens in real life right i'm not sure if you ever had to do local avoidance in real life and then you end up always choosing the right the same path <laughs> as the other person you both go for once or twice <laughs> local no avoidance solution. in real life that's a good term <laughs> um but yeah so then there were uh kind of some other options so um there was a another repo on github it's called dots nav and um that one seemed kind of interesting there is uh like local avoidance built in and they do have some kind of like good demo projects that uh work pretty well you can find it on github and uh um, oh 20 days ago modified yeah All yeah right. it, it's it's so there's something going on there it's pretty recent um it's uh it's kind of interesting the way it works basically you like define a a plane for the um units to navigate on so it doesn't you can't like do it on like a terrain or something like that you have to do basically a flat plane you know you can have it like at an angle or something or whatever um and uh so it's i to do kind of right yeah yeah and so i was kind of experimenting with that a little bit and got it like kind of working but um it, there was still a couple of things that weren't working totally correctly um and then so i'm like okay i was probably just gonna have to scrap that um and then i did come across um another solution from uh, someone named reese and this is the one that i ended up using it seems to yeah, yeah. kind of use the um built-in navigation mesh like from kind of like standard unity like it has a very similar yeah. interface to that um and you kind of like you know bake a nav mesh and all that and um it seemed to work pretty well um had like a couple little bugs with it um like for example i don't know if you saw in in the game when i was showing it off but like sometimes when the units will go basically to the destination and they get at the destination they'll like jump up like 50 feet in the air or something <laughs> i don't know if that was just a problem with um like how i was implementing it or if it was like a, a bug with the the game i haven't really looked into it too much but i, I it's just kind of like a silly little bug that i can just leave in there so it's it's fun yeah it's uh um but yeah so i, I ended up using that right. one he has uh two different um he has two different uh, like navigation libraries. So there's one um, where it's like a, a full kind of um, 
I'm gonna pull this up here so I can reference, so I can talk this. So yeah, he has a, a full navigation one, uh, which includes flocking, auto jumping, dynamic surfaces. Um, and so that's like very similar to uh, what you'd get in the regular Unity nav mesh. And then um, he also has a pathing one, which is just kind of like a, a stripped down version um, where you don't have like the flocking or auto jumping or anything, everything like that. Um, so it's, it's a little bit more, uh, a little bit more simple, which I kind of like you have those, those two different options. Um, so I ended up using the navigation one. Um, I didn't implement, uh, you know, flocking or jumping or anything like that, but um, I, I think with the pathing one, you have to actually implement your own, like the unit actually following the path. The movement, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Patrolling. yeah. Um, so I just used the navigation one because all that stuff was obviously already built in. And um, I mean, yeah, it was pretty easy and intuitive to use. There's a couple of things that I don't understand if I'm quite doing correctly, but um, yeah, it was able to work well enough for me. And, you know, the, the workers can basically path find wherever they need to go on the terrain. And um, yeah, I was, I was pretty pleased with the experience overall. That's cool to hear, man. I think I had a look at the Reese library when I was working on that and i didn't use it at the end but i got insp inspiration you know it helped me uh do some stuff I, I don't remember exactly what but one thing i learned is that things that are that look simple very often are not simple right mm -hmm. it was super hard to get this working right and then it's much more than just not pathfinding right it is also following the path itself which of course you had to program yourself and you know it's not as easy as just a zigzag, right? Like going to waypoint to waypoint. You right. just have to take into consideration the animation part, which is a huge topic in dots as well. Yeah. Like of course you cannot just do like this, right? You have to be not even lerping the orientation. You have to sometimes also, you know, play an animation which is turning to the right, yeah. turning to the left at yeah. the right speed, and then. You don't because you have a collision, maybe, right? <laughs> so there is so many variables that you know. If you want to do it like, uh, like well, like a AAA game kind of, it's incredibly complex yeah. to get right. Uh, you know, it just looks it's simple at, on the surface, but then once you start doing the small details, it explodes, man! It explodes in complexity. Yeah. No. Totally. And. Um... Yeah, even just kind of like going off that, I will uh, pull this up and remember to share my screen this time. Um, so this is, so the Unity physics system, it's um, basically like a stateless system. So it doesn't like keep track of, um, like this is the Unity dots physics. So it doesn't like keep track of like, um, there's no like simple on trigger enter, on trigger exit functions and yeah. stuff like that. Um, so I basically had to use, this is from Unity. Um, it was in kind of included in their uh, sample projects um, for dots physics. And you can see this is this like big old class here, like 330 lines long. Um, and this kind of gives you um, the, uh, you'll see there's like these stateful trigger events. And so this is what I ended up having to use um, for, um, the kind of selection area when you, um, you know, put down the selection area and you want to see like what trash is in there. Um, so I basically yeah. have kind of the on trigger enter functions to detect, um, you know, when that, that, uh, kind of when a piece of trash has essentially entered in the uh, selection area. And, um, that also happens when the selection area is, is set in that location, obviously. Um, and then, you know, you can kind of look into, um, you know, if, if, uh, a piece of trash exits the area, then you can kind of remove it from that mm -hmm. um, kind of list of things that you've been tracking. But it's a it's a very fairly complex system. Um, like I was yeah. kind of just like reading through it, and I was like, I wonder if I could, you know, implement this on my own. Maybe just kind of remove some stuff that I don't need. But um, yeah, there's a lot of stuff kind of going on here. A, a decent amount of it kind of goes over my head. So um, I ended up just using. Um, the one from Unity, and um, yeah, I mean, it was able to work pretty well for me. All right, yeah, it looks quite complex. But yeah, there's there's I guess quite it a also bit going depends. on. It also depends on your motivation levels to go through 
this implementation, right? If you are releasing a game, you have to do this, right? Yeah, exactly. So it's like, I just go straight. Yeah. If it's just for learning and such, uh, you must really be motivated to learn this, right? Mm -hmm. For me, for example, it doesn't really work that well just for the sake of learning. I always need to have a goal like, you know, I want to implement this for this project or for this prototype or something. I always have to have like a practical application. Um, I always had found it hard just to learn for the sake of learning these things, right? When I was, for example, as a kid, I was starting to learn C++. I was maybe 12 years old or something. And the first thing I did is to just to get a book on C++. And of course, I didn't finish that. I was yeah. with intentions of, you know, I'm just going to read this thousand, thousand page book on C++ and learn everything I have to learn about C++. But no, it didn't work. <laughs> However, it worked when I had to apply the stuff, right? So if you have a problem, uh, for example, like you had, right, where you have to implement uh, something for the game jam, then that works pretty well, right? Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. I, again, this was just like a game jam project, so it was just like, oh. you know, find the simplest thing that works and, and go with it. And, you know, luckily there was something available and um, it worked pretty well for me. Yeah, pretty impressed, honestly, at what you managed to pull off, especially when you had such a busy month, right? Yeah, yeah. No, it was, um, yeah, a lot of fun. Um, I mean, you can see one of the things with ECS is like, I don't know how well you can see this, but I mean, there's, you know, I have basically each data component and tag inside of its own script. Yeah. Um, but you can see there's, you know, a ton of data components and then a bunch of systems. I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and twelve. I think like thir twelve or thirteen systems. <laughs> Do you think it will be hard to explain to this to a new programmer? Like not like a noob or something, or like, you know, someone comes new to this project, would it be hard to explain it? Just thinking about, you know, the number of classes that we have here. What do you think? Yeah, that's something that um, I was kind of curious about. I think um, I, that's something that I kind of want to um, maybe like work with people a little bit more on. It's, it's kind of like teaching them, um, you know, dots and ECS and especially starting from they have, you know, little to no Unity programming experience um, and just kind of seeing, um, you know, figuring out the best way that I can teach them that and... Um, like, I mean, I, I feel like the state that, that dots in ECS is in right now is you, you do have to kind of have some uh, knowledge of, you know, just regular programming Unity because there's kind of a lot of things that you still kind of need to, like, hook into on that, that end. Um, yeah. And, yeah, I think as dots in ECS evolves, things are going to become more streamlined um, and there's not going to be as much like boilerplate code, I would hope. Um, More quality of life for the developer, right? Yeah, yeah. Like there's just like a couple kind of little things here and there where it's like you you kind of have to do a couple extra steps that um, aren't exactly intuitive. And so maybe you don't have a whole lot of program experience. It might be difficult for you to um, interpret some of the warning messages you're getting um, or do some kind of like research through the APIs to figure out uh, what you need to do. Yeah, makes sense. I mean, I guess Unity will be pretty busy with dots for the next at least five years, right? I don't know. I just said I five. Think, yeah. For and yeah, the number and, and and right now I think it is kind of targeted at you know the hardcore programmer, the people who wants to get you know down and dirty with it, and um, and and they kind of have. They, they really, you know, want to optimize for their, you know, specific use cases or whatever. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. I guess we'll see lots of improvements over the years. I would say so. All right, Johnny. I should get some uh, dinner, I believe. <laughs> you know, here's like well. 8 p.m. And I'm uh, half a starving about cat. ready to get some Let's lunch. Um, I, I do have one more thing to talk to you about if you have a couple more minutes. Yeah, let's go. I wanted to pick your brain a little bit about uh, VR, actually. 
Um, oh, VR. Yeah. What's, what's VR, man? <laughs> it's this thing called virtual reality. All right. Let's um, talk about VR. Yeah. So I, I know you kind of have a little bit of, um, you have more develop, VR development experience than I do. Um, so like, uh, what kind of headsets do you have, first of all? Sorry, what kind of? Headsets, VR, VR headsets, ah. goggles. Right now, I just have Oculus Quest 2. Nice. With a uh, broken headset, <laughs> of course. The I heard that's a problem. Yeah. Yeah. How do you, how do you like I this headset? Tape, what's, um, what's been your kind of development experience uh, with that? I mean, I started with Oculus Quest 1. Uh, like on the Quest line, of course. Yeah, I started with yeah. that, and it improved a lot, right? There's a lot of quality uh, of life improvements that they have been uh, putting out there, right? Oculus. They were very busy, you know, working on uh, the platform itself mm -hmm. that they kind of let a bit, just the developers uh, aside. Okay. Just a bit, right? Of course, they cannot focus on everything. Yeah. That the last year or something like that, they have been pushing a lot of stuff that is very interesting for developers, right? For example, the Oculus develop Developer Hub. Yeah, has I was so many tools ask any about that because I saw the the email from you that I know that um, I think you had something in your task force, right, about the uh, the yeah. whole the the hub. So yeah, what what is that all about? So you can, for example, uh, you know, manage the whole state of your quest without putting it on, which is you know for me it's super important. That's I great, hate to yeah. be with working at the same time as I have the headset on. I hate it. Sure. Uh, because you have to be like this, like this, like this, and yeah, it's annoying. Uh, but now with this, for example, with the Oculus Developer Hub, uh, you know, you get to do a lot of these things without doing, without putting it on, right? Like, if, for example, you can configure kind of uh, the Guardian system. Maybe you can disable that so it's not beeping all the time. Uh, you can, I don't know, leave the headset on all the time because if you take it off, the display is, you know, shut down. And any profiling that you do with the screen off is going to be off because I guess that the system is sleeping or something like that. Mm. So again, with the developer hub, you can also, you know, disable that. So you can, you know, just put it on the table and focus on profiling or whatever you want to do. That's with great. That and then if you ever need to like look at something, you can just, you know, pick up the headset and take a look, right? Yeah, but it's not even the, the case anywhere. It's like, you know, you just leave it like that. It, you, you you can say something like this is the kind of view that I want to have, mm -hmm. and then you like leave it on the table, and then makes sense. I mean, okay. you can also I guess you can also st stream with the headset is seen uh, through the Oculus Developer Hub. Uh, I don't do that often because it also takes some performance, so the data sure. that you get out of that will be a bit skewed. Uh, but in general, it's it's amazing, man. You know, I also have access to these performance levels, where it basically tells you the percentage of CPU that you are using, the percentage of GPU that you're using, the memory that you're using. That, that's, I mean, that's amazing, man. Yeah, there's yeah, not totally. so many places where there's not so many yeah, other that's, it, tools. That's very that's valuable that, and important that, stuff to know. That, yeah. yeah. Like in the past, if you wanted to know where's my button, like is it in the CPU or in the GPU, you had to do to test, kind of right? guess and check. Like, yeah. Okay. Is it, yeah, exactly. It's like let me reduce the resolution. Okay, if the performance is the same, then it might be a CPU button, like and such. Now it's like percentage. It's like is it hundred percent? Huh? Where could the button like be? <laughs> but, yeah, that's so. Great. Yeah, it's incredibly easy now to develop for Quest. I mean, you still need to know what to do, how to do it, and that comes out of experience, but... Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, I've been kind of, like, interested in um, looking into getting a, a VR headset or something just because, um, you know, back in back in the day, um, I, I was kind of, like, messing around with the Google Cardboard stuff a little bit, and, you know, that was kind of fun, but um, I never, I've never done any, like, kind of proper VR development, and... I know there are a number of people, um, you know, kind of in my community in the Discord and people, um, you know, asking me in the YouTube comments and stuff about, um, you know, kind of how well Dots works for VR stuff. And so I'd be definitely like interested in uh, experimenting with that. You know, I have some cool ideas for some little projects that I can make um, and just kind of like getting a good idea about the, you know, overall sense of um, development and, and, you know, how smooth it is, what are some of... Uh, kind of common issues that people might run into and stuff. 
Yeah, I mean, there's never been such a good time as now to join the community of VR development because you have the you have the the, the hardware, you have the software. I mean, you don't have the hardware yet, but if you buy it, you have it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> but yeah. But the software is amazing. And man, if you're doing dots, like this is a really good thing to do, right? Because, uh, you know, I don't know how many cores you have. I guess at least four. Uh, you know, you can do a lot of stuff with dots and quest two. Let me check quickly how many cores it has. Because I know that the operating system reserves, I think, half of that. Is it a custom so processor or is it like a AMD chip or something? It's one of these Snapdragons. Oh, okay, uh, I okay. Guess it's Snapdragon XR2. Uh, so, it's, you know, and Quest 2 is pretty up to date. It's pretty powerful, I have to say. It's more powerful than what the fans can uh, dissipate in terms of heat <laughs> or the battery can hold. So that's, they have to, you know, relax a bit with the power as well. <laughs> <laughs> Makes sense. Do you, so do you uh, have like the kind of link cable thing that you develop with? You basically have it like yeah. linked into the headset. Here's the, the cable. I bought one of these cables, which is good. It's like four meters, five meters. Okay. They're a bit expensive. That I never bought the official one. I just got a different one, right? Nice. Which I now use as well with this Chromebook, <laughs> which, you know, it's like two cores. <laughs> Pretty disappointed, but still go. USB C, right? So that's pretty good. So I think this kind of kind of cables are a good investment, right? Yeah. You can use it for many, many things. You can even use it to charge whatever you're charging because they support, I guess, up to sixty watts or something. So you cannot go wrong, man. Maybe you're still on time to buy something for Black Friday. I think they were giving out some discounts and some vouchers and such. Yeah, yeah, I know they had some kind of deals going on and stuff. What about Black Friday? How was it for you? Did you empty your wallet? <laughs> I think I only bought one thing. So I, I, I bought some things um, <clears throat> off the Unity Asset Store kind of early on. Um, some things that I'd kind of been kind of been scoping out anyways. Um, uh, so I obviously did. I did the dots net. I did a video on that. Uh, the dots networking package, um, just kind of like I did a little video overview on it. It seemed pretty cool. I was yeah. I was pretty pretty uh, impressed with it. Um, and so then uh, I bought some more uh, Cinti asset packs. I, I like the low poly stuff, and I think they're uh, easy and simple to like throw into some videos and stuff. And you know, obviously mm -hmm. that was um, kind of some a lot of the stuff that I did with the the game jam. Yeah, that's the way to go, man. So yeah, think about the quest. I think it's a good thing to try it. Uh, in your case, like you can do so much with dots and on quest, like four cores. It's like yeah, 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 totally. What else can you be asking for? Of course, your CPU with has sixteen <laughs> cores. But, you know, exactly. Talking yeah. about mobile. When are you gonna get a? And one of the things I think is the... one of the things I think is critical. Uh, is that it's just not only about performance, right? It is also about doing work or the same amount of work more efficiently. Yes, yeah. Because on mobile, it's critical, right? To spend less cycles doing useless work, you know, if you do this yeah, in a exactly. more efficient yeah. way. Yeah, mobile and VR, you know, you don't want the processor being overworked because it's going to drain their yes. battery. It's going to overheat the device. Exactly. And like that is a, a much more poor user performance than, you know, not having 120 frames per second, you know? Yeah, indeed. And then once you are there, once you have a super high performing application, you can decide, okay, should I stay at 72 frames per second and keep more battery life and such? Or should I just go 120 FPS and, you know. Yeah, it gives you much you more just... flexibility to, to decide exactly. and make That's... those trade offs on your own rather than you know, being limited by being locked in, you know. That's the point, man. If you can choose, then that's already a win. But if you can't because you are performing at 30 FPS on VR, then that's uh, the bad situation to be in. Yeah. And oh, I cool. have been there, right? Where you start an application and oh, it's yeah. like performing at 10 FPS or something and you have to have a bucket around you just in case. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe on a Chromebook or something like that. <laughs> Oh, Jesus, yeah. <laughs> I don't know, man. I think I spent like 300 bucks in one of this. 
and it was like a discounted piece of hardware mm -hmm. that it was discounted because it was just like there in public, right? People were touching that and all that, oh, okay. all stuff. And that's how I sh saved like 50 bucks, but it's, in my opinion, it's not even worth 200 bucks, honestly. It's like it's super hard, bad hardware. Yeah, I I bought a, a Mac Mini a couple years ago and I was really, really unimpressed with it. Like it was basically brand new out of the box and I'm the impressed. thing was just like so slow. I'm like, uh, okay. I mean, I think the, yeah. the new ones with the M1 chip are probably better, but this was uh, one from a little bit yes, ago. It looks super powerful, man. The new ones, they're doing a pretty good job at engineering at Apple, right? They are ARM based and they are catching up sometimes with our Ryzen's right? In terms of single thread performance. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the system on a chip that just like completely Crazy. removes the, the bottleneck of, you know, the memory traveling through the bus and all that. So it's, it's impressive stuff. So yeah, grab yourself. Do uh, you know what, Johnny? Do yourself a favor. Grab a quest too. <laughs> then the next thing you need to do is to join my Unity Performance Task Force. I think you're a member already. I am. Yes. But if not, it's you great. should. Totally. And then you head on to this URL. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna check out the uh, the new lesson that you put up. Was it, was it yesterday or something like that? I'm gonna check it out tonight. Um, yeah. I'm excited to see you know kind of what options are available to us in the the Quest to Developer Console. Here it is. Here's the link if you want to see it now. Just a small preview for my for your audience. You're going to even see my happy face that I have in the video. Man, I should really change my thumbnails. They really <laughs> suck. Just for fun, let's see it. So All I right. call this lesson Juicing the Oculus, the Oculus Developer, Developer Hub. Hand. Not sure if that's a good title, but I was like, huh. <laughs> and that's my face. <laughs> look how happy I look there, man. Just wearing the headset. You look, I think you look I was so wearing stoked. it for half you an hour. You look so stoked to be inside the metaverse right now. <laughs> they should uh, probably Facebook should use my pictures for marketing. <laughs> like this is the feature of VR. And, uh, so this is me, the like, real uh, VR. Grand, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think I just forgot to update the thumbnail, <laughs> but don't judge me. <laughs> anyway, in that yeah, lesson, I, I, I mean, I, I, real quickly, I just think that you know, obviously, with you know the Facebook's whole metaverse thing, I think there's going to be you know a lot of opportunities for developers coming up. Um, especially in the VR, AR, XR space. Um, it seems like Facebook or Meta now, they're you know really doubling, tripling down on it. Um, you know, I've heard rumors that of um, you know, very, very high salaries from, from Facebook. Um, yeah, indeed, indeed. The VR industry is exploding, right? Yeah, yeah. So, and... you know, it'll, it'll be interesting to see where it goes. And, um, you know, I think you know, with a data oriented mindset um, could be really important for that. You know, again, goes back to just being able to, um, you know, make better experiences on these, these, um, I don't want to necessarily call this a low end device, but I mean, it's obviously not as powerful as, as a desktop PC or something. Yeah, but it's really caught up in performance, right? But this is true that, you know, VR is exploding, but the number of people who can do two things at the same time has not. And these two things is mm -hmm. one, VR development, and two, performance optimization, right? Boom. Because people, you know, you want to offer the best graphics, you want to offer the best whatever, and uh, you, for that, you need to, to know both, right? Mm -hmm. You need to know how to develop totally. VR games yeah. or experiences, and you know how to, you know, develop high efficient, not only code, but how to use Unity in a way that it just allows you to show the best content that you have. This it is so common to get. I have so many clients that are like, you know, I have these graphics, all these assets that my artists have put all together, mm -hmm. but I can't use it because my quest, you know, is running at 60 FPS, which is, you know, falling short of. So I can this. Just one second. <laughs> this girl is complaining, right? There you go. You complain so Adorable. much. Adorable. <laughs> yeah go lick my coffee thanks <laughs> so i think that combination of skills is pretty rare right but it's in a lot of demand that's why i have so many clients that you know they they're asking me to help them with the optimization right on quest so if you manage 
to develop uh, both skill sets like optimization and VR development. Mm -hmm. I think in the upcoming five to ten years, you're going to be, you know, having a very comfortable lifestyle. I'd say, if you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah, it'll be super interesting to see where all this this all goes. But yeah. So if you want to develop the second skill set, you should join my task force. Yes, indeed. And just because join Johnny... Urban's, uh game development performance task force, you can use the links down in the description below. I think it's just tmg.dev slash task force. It'll bring you right there. Um, and yeah, you can join in. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, Ruben's putting out good videos every week on all different areas of performance, um, whether it be CPU, GPU, memory, or um, what's the other one you call pro performance. performance. Yeah, yeah. And just because we are friends, Johnny, I decided to leave the first seven days for free. Something I have never done so far. Have to be honest with you there. Never. Awesome. It's also always a paid trial because I think that the content is there is super good. But I will make an exception for you. Maybe just this week. Huh? Maybe after this week, I will take that offer off. Cool. But Sounds if you good. want to, you know, develop the skills that the VR industry, and not only VR, like the whole game industry requires, then you should give it a give it a try, right? Give it a check because yeah, yeah, it I think is you in have high a, a lot of good content in there. I mean, there's just like some things that you know, kind of everyone should know. Like one of the more kind of recent ones that you put up that I, I really liked. It was kind of a simple one that you did. Um, was talking about why the equals equals uh, operator is expensive, and you kind of, you know, uh, go in, in into a little bit more detail on that about uh, why that is, and kind of some of the alternatives that you have. Um, so I think that's just something like really important for developers to know and understand. Like, you know, obviously I've I've kind of like you know heard that the equals equals is expensive, but you know it's good to learn a little bit more about why that exactly is and, and kind of what some of the alternatives what can are. What do about it? Yeah, it's indeed better than going to the cinema, to the cinema, man. Just to the, instead hey. of going to the movies, just you know, exactly. order just, some pizza and watch some of this. Just kick back with some Unity Performance Task Force. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. By the way, just the last thing I have to say is that performance is super important. Not only VR, it's just also the trend of you know making so many devices and putting them in the market that support higher frame rates and higher frequencies, right? Yeah. Like me, for example, I have a 240 hertz monitor. And I think this phone, I don't know, my phone is there, but I think the screen supports 120 nice. hertz. And you see people actually demanding this kind of uh, frame rates, right? Yeah. Like yeah. I've seen so many bad reviews on Steam. It's like, hey, dude, your game only supports <laughs> 60 FPS. Give me my money back, loser. Yeah, you know, where you need to have your update loop for across all your systems need to complete in like a fraction of a millisecond. Yes, and that doesn't happen automatically. Sorry, Unity. I know Unity tells you <laughs> performance by default, but it does not happen like that. I mean, otherwise I wouldn't have clients. <laughs> so nice. Nice. All well, right. Cool. Yeah, this was awesome. So um, I think we talked a lot of, uh, about a lot of good stuff. Uh, hope you all enjoyed it. Unfortunately, we couldn't do this live to have kind of some live interaction, but um, we'll figure out what's going on with that. And um, you know, hopefully we can do some more of these uh, actual live ones soon, find some better uh, kind of solutions for that. But uh, yeah, thank you, Ruben, for joining on today. Uh, do you have anything else to say before we head off? Yes. We talked about a lot of garbage today, yeah? That's a <laughs> tended pen. An empire but of trash. What, what is it gonna have for lunch, man? I think um, I I haven't gone to the I didn't go to the grocery store over the weekend because I was working on the game jam. But I think I'm just gonna run down at Chipotle, grab a nice little burrito okay. bowl. You have Chipotle amazing. where you at? Nope. Do you know what that is? I think that the worst kind of food I can have here is a kebab. If you know what I mean. I mean, this is Berlin. Berlin yeah, is full yeah. of. We got kebabs out uh, here. Kebabs. <laughs> I don't know what I will take, but probably it will not be healthy at this point. <laughs> nice. Well, but enjoy man, your thanks dinner. Thanks for having me in the the in the non-live stream. The non-live live stream. Yeah, I mean, it's good to hang out with you, catch up, talk about game development a little bit. I'm sure we'll do another one of these soon. Again, uh, hopefully it'll be live. But um, yeah, thanks again, Ruben. And thanks again, everyone, for joining. Have a nice day. We'll see you.